This morning I, was re I noticed a headline of an article and it was uh, lawmakers planning financial Armageddon for all Christian schools. And I read through the uh, article, it wasn't a surprise, it was just a surprise that it's this quick. But the, uh, in California, they are, have a bill before their uh, lawmakers now to pass the law that all colleges, including Christian colleges, have to honor transgenders, even to the point of forms with the opposite uh, physical sex. And uh, if that doesn't happen, then they will lose all of their financial assistance. Students will not be able to get uh, scholarships, et cetera, or loans. And uh, this, we knew this was coming just a little bit quicker than we expected. I would like for you to stand with me this morning. We don't know where we'll be next year at this time. Uh, America, great nation, is uh, toying on the uh, precipice sliding over the cliff, and we need to be really serious about praying for our country that God will help the church, first of all, to awaken to the lateness of the hour and to the truth that we know and hold so dear to our hearts and that, that we will have a positive influence uh, in holding back the tide of sin in our world. Can you say amen to that? Let's pray and let's agree together, Father. We know that these are perilous times and these are last day times. We don't know how much time we have left before you come, but surely you are coming soon. There is a limit to what you will allow to happen in our world. And it seems like, Father, we've lost all sense of, of uh, propriety and uh, things that you would not be acceptable in any other generation have been become acceptable today. And we pray for the church of Jesus Christ, every Christian parent, to awaken to the fact that if they don't proclaim the truth, the truth will be lost. And help us to be about the business of standing firm on the Word of God and trusting the Holy Spirit to once again blow across this great nation and cause us to have a spiritual awakening that will alter our course, give us a few more years to reach out to those who have never heard about Jesus Christ. Lord, we, we need you, and tonight, this morning we acknowledge that. And we... And we ask you with all of our hearts, intervene in our country, we pray. Do a mighty work, Lord. We need you and show us, show us the way that you would have us to go in these difficult days, we pray. Lord, we bless you. We praise you for it now. In Jesus' name, and as we look into the word of God, lead us, guide us, direct us, Speak to us from your word today, we pray. In Christ's name we ask, amen. While you remain standing, if you have a Bible, turn with me to John chapter 6 and verse beginning at verse number 16. John chapter 6 and verse number 16. Or I'm going to start reading at 15, but you can pick me up at 16 on the board. It says, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again. Notice that. He withdrew again to the mountain by himself. And we know that Jesus often got alone, solitude, one of the disciplines of the church, solitude, to be alone with God and to allow God to speak to our life. And Jesus practiced that profusely. And then it, we pick it up. It says, when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. 
got into the boat, into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. I've entitled this message, The Perfect Storm. And I think, uh, I've not seen the movie. I've, I've, uh, I know there has been a movie, The Perfect Storm. I can, I've not seen it. But I think we see a perfect storm brewing in America. And uh, no matter which way you go, it'll be wrong for some people. But uh, God, here's a perfect storm. You say, well, Pastor, today is uh, uh, Memorial Sunday and we're recognizing graduates. Is this an appropriate message? And I think, yes, rightly so it is. Because this these few verses that I've read have in them a life lesson that it would do good for every person to take to heart, especially our graduates. You're in transition from one stage of life to another, and many, many, many people have difficulty in this stage. But if we follow and accept and embrace the life lesson in this passage, it will have a profound effect upon our life. Here's the life principle. Don't embark on the sea of life without Jesus Christ in your boat. As the pilot of your boat, don't embark on the sea of life without Christ. At, as, uh, at the helm of your boat. This is what the disciples did. The alternative is to do what is right in our own eyes. I was reading uh, just a few days ago a scripture that's repeated in the book of Judges. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. In talking with Christians, I find the same rationale for decision making. This seems right. And this is what I'm going to do. It's, what, it's right. It seems right to me. But no mention of seeking God's will or God's purpose or seeing is this right with God? Is this part of God's will for my life? and my journey, and uh, they make decisions that are altering and down the road will have an effect upon their life, either positive or negative. And I'm, I, as I mulled this over in my mind, are we where they were in the book of Judges? It is, it's called by theologians the Wild West Days of the Scripture. When everybody did what was right in their own eyes. I, I noticed the song that David led us in a while ago. Before it talks about laying down our life, it talks about laying down our rights. And as we sang that, I asked myself the question, have we really done that? Have we laid our rights aside and said, I have no rights because I've surrendered them to Jesus Christ. I don't have the right to decide. My right now is to find his will and to order my life according to the will of God. And that's good advice. That'll do you good in the long run. The alternative, do what's right in your own eyes. I see decisions that seem right, but the Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man. But the end thereof is the way of death. Guess who is at the helm of that life? 
We, we, have the, we have the steering wheel in our hands and we're not about to give it up. Life is susceptible to sudden storms. The question is not if storms will come. The question is when will they come? How severe will they be? What form will they take? Will it be spiritual? Will it be relational? Will it be financial? Will it be physical? They come to good and evil. I, I know what it's like to have the doctor look and say, it's cancer. And those words are like, you don't want, ever want to hear. And uh, third stage. And you're thinking, my Lord, this is not what I expected. And the storm is raging. I remember when uh, I first found that I had glaucoma. And the doctor said, You've had, you probably had glaucoma as a teenager. And it's now affecting your optic nerve in the right eye. I can help you for five years. That was seven years ago. But after that, I don't know. And I used to wake up at night and think about, what will it be like to lose my sight? To all of a sudden be blind. And fear would grip my heart. Yesterday or Thursday, I was in his office for my annual checkup. And he said, uh, I'm glad that I can tell you that in three years, there's, been, there's no change. It is so slight that I would say no change in your eyes. And brother, those are good words to hear. You can't do anything about it. You can't rip it out. You can't take a pill and get rid of it. What do you do? What you've learned to do, you go to the Lord. And you begin to pray along with God's people. And I think about Diana and Chris as the diagnosis came and that beautiful little girl. It's heartbreaking. But all of a sudden, the storm is brewing. And we need our Lord to help us to, to stand with us. You see, storms test the strength of life foundations. What are you building your life upon? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 and 25, If you hear my word and do them, you will be like a man that built his house upon a rock. The rains came, the winds blew, but the house stood. Why? Because it was built on a strong foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the kind of life that will never crumble, that is built upon Jesus Christ. And so they test our foundations. When you walk through the waters, the prophet Isaiah said, Isaiah chapter 43 and verse number 2. He doesn't say if you go through the waters, but he says in verse 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you, for I am the Lord your God. The Holy One of Israel, your Savior, I gave Egypt as your ransom and Cush and Serba in exchange for you because you are precious in my eyes. Did you know that? That you are precious in God's sight. And that honored, and I've lo I love you. I gave men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, from the west. I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up. And to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar, my daughters from the ends of the earth. And on it goes. But storms come to the good, to the bad. 
to those who are in the will of God and out of the will of God. Storms come. You say, what's the point? The point is we're not alone in the storm. The master of the storm is with us. And that makes everything. It all comes about when you take Jesus on your life journey. But oftentimes in college, there's a tendency to lay him aside, to get disconnected from church, and to just do your thing. We, I, I, we have been blessed. Two of our three kids have gone to Christian college. But you can find any kind of person in a Christian college. You can find the same type of people. But our daughter went to a secular school, basically. And we said, okay, if you get in a full gospel, spirit-filled church, not just attend the church, but be a part of the church. And that's, that's what it takes. You've got to continue to feed yourself spiritually through those years, or you will come out like 85% of those who go to a secular school come out with no faith or a watered down faith. And we want to keep our faith. We want it to be a biblical faith. Amen? If the Bible says it, I believe it. I'm liking you guys over here. This is my amen corner today. But I need your help over on this side. You're going to have to wake up over here, okay? And so here we are. You see, take Jesus. He sees our struggles. When they embark, the scripture plainly says, Jesus had not yet come to them. They were waiting and waiting. And now darkness has set in. And Jesus isn't here. And so they got in the boat. And they began to make their way across the lake. They were experienced fishermen. They knew, they knew that lake like the back of their hand. They had crossed it hundreds of times and had fished in it in every part of it. But you know, sometimes our strength becomes our weakness. When we think we can handle it, I know this, I can take care of it. And we think we can deal with it, then it becomes a stumbling block. And we set off in our own strength. And we, we find ourselves in over our head. You see, they were not depending on him. And starting out on the sea of life, leaning on your own strength is a no winner. I remember telling my dad as a, as a teenager, because I had to go to church every time the doors opened. And they opened up pretty regularly twice on Sunday and once on Wednesday, and if revival, every night. And I went with Dad. He said, when I go, you're going. And he went every time the doors opened and sometimes would find a church in the community with revival services, and I would go there too. But I said, Dad, when I get out from under your control, I'll never go to church again. Now those were, isn't it strange? Look where I'm at. I'll never go to church. But I told dad in his last days, in the, in the nursing home, unable to do anything, unable to walk, unable to do anything for himself, I said, dad, what I found was I wasn't in church, church was in me. And when I got married, what did I do? The first Sunday Betty and I were together, we went to church. I'll never forget, I, it doesn't sound like a church person talking. I said, now we're going to church and we're going to my church. Thank God I took spiritual headship from the beginning, even though I was lost as a goose. We're going to my church, but we're not going to get religious. Now, I married a good wife. Thank you very much. She was such a good cook that in the first six months of our marriage, I went through three sets of clothes. When you're eating fried pork chops and biscuits and gravy and mashed potatoes every night, I mean, it, was, it doesn't get any better than that. 
And I say that to say this. About six months into our marriage, something began, there was a haunting sense in my life. Something is missing. Something is missing in my life. It was about that time that I came to faith in Christ Jesus. And when Christ became my Savior, that missing element was gone. I felt a completeness. I felt this is what I've been missing because it's not possible to build the same quality and kind of life without Christ as you do when you lay down your rights and let him be Lord of your life. And that, I'm not the wisest man. I'm not the smartest guy. But my mama didn't raise any dumb kids either. And I said, check it up. That's a good one for me. Because I recognized there was something missing. But when the winds of adversity began to blow, and they will blow, they were tossed about like a rag doll. Verse 17 indicates that they didn't take the, the course that they, just, they wanted to take. But the storm determined the course they would take. Because they couldn't go any other direction. And that's what a storm will do to you if you don't have Christ in your life. It can blow you off of your foundation. It can send you in directions that you don't really choose to go in. A storm is a deadly thing. I'm glad we're not on the coast this morning. I don't know how bad it is, but it's just a tropical storm. But it could be a lot of rain. We need the rain if it doesn't wash us away. Amen? And so I'm praying it doesn't. But they took an involuntary course determined by the wind. Mark said in Mark 6, 48, they were making headway painfully. Jesus came to them in the fourth watch. You know what time that was? Between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. For nine hours they had labored trying to row that boat, trying to go in the direction that they knew they should. And they had made no progress hardly, maybe three and a half miles in nine hours of work. Matthew says they were beaten by the waves for the wind was against them. But they couldn't see it, but Jesus was on the mountain praying. And the scripture says he saw them. He watched them. And he came to them. Now the question is, why would Jesus allow them to toil all night? Reach a point of hopelessness. Exhaustion. Before finally coming to where they were. Well, Mark tells us in chapter 6 in verse 52. He says, for they did not understand about the loaves. You see, just before this, Jesus took five loaves, two fish, fed 5,000 men, and they took up 12 baskets full. But they didn't understand the significance of that. Their hearts were hardened. Now, I want you to listen to this statement that I'm about to make. This is very important. Their hearts were not hardened by sin. They were gospel hardened. They had heard the message, seen the miracles, and it had become old hat to them. And they didn't see beyond the physical eating of the bread and the fish and understand that only God could multiply a loaf of bread and two little fish and feed that many people with it. Their hearts were hard. And as I look out over this congregation today, pastors can have a hardened heart to the gospel. The parishioner can be hardened to the gospel. Been there, done that, have my t-shirt, thank you. 
I don't need to go that way again. And the heart becomes hard. Did you know a hard heart is not a believing heart? And that's why when they saw Jesus, they thought he was a ghost. And they were scared out of their skin. Because they were not operating in faith. They were not expecting the Lord to come. But he did. The only reason Jesus allows adversity to come into a person's life is to draw them closer to him. If you get out of from under his protection and you're disobedient, then you take whatever comes. But Jesus will allow adversity to draw us closer. What is the significance of walking on water? It demonstrates the power, his power over the elements, his ability to deliver out of any situation. Whenever we are working with folks with life-altering, controlling situations, they come from various backgrounds, I get concerned because I know in my heart of hearts until you experience the power of God, you will not cast those yokes off of your life. But if you learn who he is and what he's able to do, no matter how severe your affliction is or your addiction is, he breaks every chain. He liberates the captive, opens a prison door, and sets you free. Your life is changed. That's how Jesus works. But it's not just hearing, it's accepting and believing and seeing. He intervenes in our struggles. He spoke words of comfort. I couldn't help but think of Something that happened to me, and I'm not, I'm not an artist. At least I don't draw pictures. When I was in school, I had to take art. I could not draw a stick man. <laughs> I hated art. But I was in my first pastorate, and... You know, when you're in a building project or you're dealing with issues and you're, you're trying to get a church moved and turned and going in the right direction, and I had my hands full, one morning before the Sunday service, I slipped away into somebody else's office so no one could find me. And as I was there meditating and praying, I looked up on the wall and there was a picture there that spoke to my heart. It was a boat with a sailor in a storm. Maybe you've seen it. And standing behind him with his hand on his shoulder was Jesus. The other hand was on the wheel to steady his hand. And that turned my life around at that moment. I'm not by myself. I'm not alone in this circumstance. Is there adversity? Yes. But listen, the man who is in control of adversity walks with me. And he's guiding my boat. I'm going to arrive at my destination that he has set for my life. Because he is the pilot. He's in control of my life. If he isn't, you're not going to arrive at the right destination. You're going to end up at your destination. I remember, these are some things that have come back that I guess, it's, I don't know if it's bad to remember, but things that come back to you. I do remember pastoring a church that was, was growing. In fact, I was invited to Mecca, Springfield, Missouri, they were having a church growth conference in Springfield and they invited me up 
to tell the story of what God was doing in the church that I pastored. At the height of church growth, here's what I experienced. In those days, they used to talk about a midlife crisis. Anybody ever heard of that? They said around 40, you would have it. Well, I, was a, I wasn't 40 yet, but I was having my pre-midlife crisis, I guess. Because all of a sudden, I found myself again, just like when I'd been married six months. Something isn't right. Something isn't in order. And I said to myself, is this all there is to pastoring? Thank God for the souls that are being saved. I feel so empty. I feel so dry. And I discovered again, success cannot fill that vacuum. No matter how successful you are, it will never satisfy the deepest longing of a soul. There's only one satisfaction, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you have Christ, you've got everything. When you're in his will, you are, you are a blessed person. What I was missing was intimacy with the Lord because work can never substitute for relationship. Not in the family and not in the church. God wants to know us and wants us to know him. There's a switch in life that takes place. I don't know when it kicks but it's when you move from success to that which is meaningful. Completion. Satisfying. And that's when Christ is the center of our hearts. We need him today. He intervenes in our struggles. He is saying to someone this morning, it's me, it's I. Don't be afraid. I'm the one who has power over the elements and over the storm. I'm the one who loves you. I'm the one who died for you. The one who provides for you. The one who watches over your, your soul. The one who never, ever leaves you nor forsakes you. I am, I am he. The Bible says then they were glad to take him into the boat. And I believe that what happened to them when he, was, when he spoke to them, his word. You know, if you're a student of a scripture, a word comes alive to you, how it touches you, and how you feel it to the core of your being. I believe his word had a profound effect on them. And they had a new appreciation for him and a new dependence on him. And Matthew says even this, they worshiped him as God. They saw who he was. They immediately reached their destination. I want to tell you, we should do a t-shirt and put this on it. Life is better when we trust in him. Life is better when Jesus is in the picture. He either takes us out of the struggle or he takes us through the struggle. And most of the time, God takes us through. For me, I, I will say, we need Jesus in our life. We need to let him get on in the boat. But that's not enough. For a Christian, it's just a step. It's not enough just to let him on our, in our boats. We've got to let him steer. Let him be the one who yells the commands. 
We no longer insist on being the captain, but we become the deckhand. I don't like that plaque that says God is my co-pilot. That's not true. He's the pilot. I'm the co-pilot. He's in control. I promise you, I make this promise to every person in this room that if you let Christ be the captain of your boat, you will never be sorry. I've been with a number of people over the years in their last moments. I've never had a Christian say, I'm sorry I served the Lord. But I've heard a lot of people say, I wished I had. I wished I had done differently. But never anyone, I'm sorry, Pastor, that I've served the Lord. You won't be either. The greatest decision I ever made in my life was as 18 and a half years of age when I said, okay, God, I can't fight you and win. I'm going to join you. I'm going to accept what you're saying. He changed my life. It's better today than it was then. And it gets better and better and better the further you go. I want you just to bow with me for a moment. A little bit later, we're going to give you an opportunity to respond and to do something. We we owe God at least a response. You say, well, I'm not responding. Well, that is a response. That's no. I'm going to captain my own ship. I'm going to do it my way. You go God's way. You get God's benefit. They're out of this world. I want to pray right now for all of us that we keep him at the helm in control of our lives. Lord Jesus, I love you. And I pray especially for our graduates today toward this end, that this life principle, don't embark on the sea of life without Jesus in the boat. Don't think you can make it in your own strength. Let him be in charge of your journey. He has a will for you, a purpose for your birth. And to find that purpose and do it is success. I pray for every graduate. That is, if those that go to college find a spirit-filled, Bible-believing church and get involved in it and make that an integral part of their education to walk with God, to be a witness even on the campus, I pray. Lord, I bless you. I thank you today for what you're doing in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to ask our ushers if it would help us and then we'll pick up and complete this.